guys. So this week we're going to be talking about fiscal policy, um, chapter 16. Last week we talked about chapter 15 over monetary policy, which is conducted by the Federal Reserve Bank. But this week we'll be talking about fiscal policy, which is conducted by the President and Congress. As you can see, we're going a little bit more low tech this week. The person I was borrowing the iPad from needed it back, so we have improvised and are now going to um, do it like this. So as far as what we'll be covering during this chapter, it will be mainly what is fiscal policy, kind of the effect it has on real GDP and price level. Um, we'll be talking about government purchases and tax mul multipliers, as well as like the limits involved in using fiscal policy to stabilize the economy and then touching on deficits and surpluses as well as long-run fiscal policy and economic growth. So as far as kind of um, can government fiscal policy increase economic growth, remember we're thinking about government spending as a component of real GDP. Remember Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. Um, so this kind of using that model, it makes it appear as though increases in government spending increases output and other in therefore increases other relevant economic variables. Um, similarly, a tax cut would leave more money for households to spend on consumption. So then we'd increase our C component of real GDP. So when we're talking about fiscal policy itself, what fiscal policy is, it's, it refers to changes in federal taxes and purchases that are intended to achieve macroeconomic policy directives or objectives. So state and like um, state taxes and state spending, those aren't generally aimed at affecting the national level objectives. Um, but we do want to talk about how some forms of government spending and taxes automatically increase and decrease as we move along the business cycle. Remember, we talked about recessionary periods, expansionary periods, the peaks and the troughs. So some forms of government spending and taxes, they automatically increase and decrease um, with the business to cycle with the business cycle. And these are called automatic sta stabilizers. So kind of an example of an automatic stabilizer would be um, talking about unemployment insurance. So what happens during kind of a recessionary period, unemployment insurance payments, they are going to be larger or they are larger during recessions. Okay, so on one side we have automatic stabilizers which occur um, automatically with the business cycle and then we also have what's called discretionary discretionary fiscal policy which refers to intentional actions the government takes to change spending or taxes so essentially what's happening right now 
stimulus. So obviously there are some automatic stabilizers that are occurring right now, um, but we do have um, discretionary attentional fiscal policy that's occurring that the um, president and Congress have has passed. So now kind of let's move into um, the effect overall fiscal policy has on real GDP and price level. So when we think about um, Congress and the president, they're gonna be carrying out fiscal policy through, through two main things. The first being changes in government purchases. And then the second being changes in taxes. So when it comes to changes in government purchases, um, remember that's going to directly affect AD or aggregate demand. Remember because Y equals C plus I plus G plus in X, so we're talking about the G component. And then how do changes in taxes affect um, GDP? So changes in taxes, they actually will affect income, which in turn affects consumption. Income, which then affects consumption, so the C component. Consumption. So the important thing to note is that government purchases, those have direct effects, but changes in income is going to have an indirect effect on aggregate demand. So it affects consumption, which indirectly affects aggregate demand. Okay. So now let's talk about the two um, sides of fiscal policy. Again, just like we had expansionary monetary policy and contractionary monetary policy, we have the same thing for fiscal policy. So expansionary, Expansionary fiscal policy involves increasing government purchases or decreasing taxes. Um, while on the flip side, um, contractionary contractionary fiscal policy involves decreasing government purchase or increasing taxes. So now I'm going to show you how this looks on our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model graphs. So again, we have our two graphs here. I'm gonna put expansionary on the left, contractionary on the right. Okay, so remember in our model, we had our short run aggregate supply. We also had a long run aggregate supply. We had our price level. We had GDP. So we're gonna put that over here as well. So expansionary policy, it involves increasing government purchases or decreasing taxes. So if the government believes that we are in a recessionary period, we believe that real GDP is below potential GDP. So we're in a period that looks something like this. So remember, this is potential GDP right here. Let's label that B. And we are currently right here over at A. So our potential GDP is 
greater than our real GDP at this point in time. Because remember, potential GDP is shown by the long run aggregate supply curve. So in this case, what should we do in order to restore long run equilibrium and decrease unemployment? We need to enact expansionary fiscal policy in order to shift our aggregate demand curve to the right. So this is aggregate demand one, then we have aggregate demand two. We're wanting to conduct a expansionary policy to shift aggregate demand right, because remember, when we're doing expansionary policy, we are increasing G, and hopefully we are also trying to increase C as well. So shifting aggregate demand to the right is then going to cause um, us to increase our potential increase to potential GDP, hopefully. And then also what happens is we're going to see a increase in the price level as well. Okay. So on the other side of that, so I'll just quickly mark, um, I just want to mark these in different colors. So we have our long run here, long run aggregate supply, and then we have our short run aggregate supply. And then we have our aggregate demand. So again, we're going to have our long run aggregate supply. We're going to have short run aggregate supply. And then we are going to have, in this case, remember, we're going to be conducting contractionary fiscal policy, which means the economy is producing above potential GDP. And so we're going to be somewhere, we're going to, it's going to look like this. So we have aggregate demand one here. So remember, we are producing at a point that's greater than our potential GDP. So we have, this is going to be A and this is going to be B. So what do we need to do? We need to cool down the economy. We need to um, contract it a little, contract it a little bit in order to curb um, inflation. And so what we're going to do is going to decrease government purchases or increase taxes, which is going to cause our aggregate demand curve to shift to the left this time, which also decreases potential GDP and reigns in inflation. So again, let's just mark our long run aggregate supply curve, our short run aggregate supply curve, and then we have our shift in um, aggregate demand, which I thought I had another color. Got it. So I'm just gonna show the new aggregate demand curve in green so y'all can just see that. So our aggregate demand curve two is gonna be in green. So, okay, let's move on to our next page. So at the top of this next page, you can kind of just see a table uh, summary of what I just explained in the two graphs. So if we have a recession, then we're gonna conduct expansionary policy, which is increasing government purchases or cutting taxes, which is then gonna call, hopefully cause real GDP and the price level to rise. On the flip side, if we have rising inflation or if we're in too much of an expansionary period, we're gonna to try to contract the economy a little bit, which involves decreasing government purchases or raising taxes. And so GDP and the price level are going to fall. It's important to note that um, the effects kind of described, they're gonna be assuming Ceridus Paribus which remember is all else equal, um, including the idea of monetary policy as well. So contractionary fiscal policy, it's not really actually causing prices to fall. It's causing inflation itself to be lower than it otherwise would have been. Okay, so as far as 16.3, again, we're not gonna get into the dynamic aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. There's too many shifts going on. 
Um, and so let's go ahead and move on to 16.4. So 16.4 is over government purchases and the tax um, multipliers. Essentially, if the government increases its spending on goods and services, aggregate demand is supposed to increase immediately. Remember, going back to our Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports, if you increase G, Y should go up as well. Um, so what this is called is this is an autonomous increase. Autonomous increase in aggregate demand. However, but then people are going to receive this increased spending as increased income, which causes them to increase their consumption spending accordingly. What this is called, this is actually induced aggregate demand. So we have an autonomous increase in aggregate demand and an induced increase in aggregate demand. So essentially, when we think about all of the induced increases that kind of result, um, that what's that what that is called is the multiplier effect. So the multiplier effect it's a series of induced increases in consumption. Spending. Oh, y'all can't see me writing that. Let me just move that up. Okay, so multiplier effect, a series of induced increases in consumption spending that results from the initial increase in autonomous expenditure. So kind of in order to kind of pre predict the eventual change in um, autonomous expenditures, you have to know how large the multiplier is. And so what we can do, we can actually kind of describe the multiplier using a formula. So we're going to describe the total effect of a change and increase and decrease in government purchases or taxes by measuring um, overall the change in equilibrium real GDP. So the government purchases multiplier, I'm just going to write those two formulas down here. So the government purchases multiplier that's going to equal the change in equilibrium change in equilibrium GDP divided by our change in government I'm just going to abbreviate that purchases So then let's now think about the tax multiplier. The tax multiplier, that's going to equal the change in, again, equilibrium GDP divided by change in taxes. So we want to think about the tax multiplier. It's going to be a negative because an increase in taxes will decrease equilibrium real GDP versus a decrease in taxes is going to increase equilibrium real GDP. We also expect that the tax multiplier is going to be um, smaller than the government purchases multiplier. 
because we have to we want to think about um remember when we talked about the marginal propensity to, to consume and the marginal propensity to save um essentially when we think about if there's a tax cut um part of the ta uh, money is going to be spent while part of it is going to actually be saved okay so when we think about the effect of changes in the tax rate, we want to think about how the tax multiplier applies to changes in the amount of taxes without changing tax rates. So if we decrease the tax rate, they're gonna, there's going to be a slightly different effect um, that we'll summarize. So if we have a decrease in tax rates, the effects, what's going to happen is it's going to increase disposable income which results in increased consumption spending and then the second um, effect is going to be a decrease in tax rates it's going to increase the size of the multiplier. Since more of any increase in income becomes disposable income. We're not going to get too much into kind of the multiplier effect and how it actually is shown on a graph. Okay. Last page. Um, and so actually one more thing about, um, one more thing about the multiplier really quick, um, an increase in government purchases and a cut in taxes are going to have a positive multiplier effect, but a decrease in government purchases and an increase in taxes is going to have a negative multiplier effect. So now let's go ahead and move on. So as far as 16.5, again, we talked about um, some limitations to monetary policy. So now we're going to talk about some limitations um, to fiscal policy um, as far as stabilizing the economy. But there are several reasons why um, fiscal policy may be less effective than monetary policy at countercyclical stabilization. And countercyclical st stabilization is just a fancy way to say um, uh, like stabilization of the economy. So... Pretty much the main things we want to focus on are the idea of um, or the I is the idea of timing of fiscal policy. So the reason that timing fiscal policy is harder is due to one legislative dis delay and two implementation delay. So let's legislative delay. That's essentially the idea that Congress needs to agree on the actions. So we definitely saw this um, during, during this kind of uncertain period. We saw a lot of free fall in the uh, stock market because um, there was a lot of uncertainty whether or not Congress was gonna be able to pass the stimulus bill because there was um, uh, essentially needed to be a, a bipartisan agreement. Um, to, to make this happen. And so essentially there'll be a delay legislatively to try to get these things agreed on and passed. Another thing we wanna consider is the idea of an implementation delay. Um, so when we think about large spending projects, so essentially they actually may take months. 
or even years to begin after approval. So if we think about it, the first um, stimulus checks um, are kind of going out this week um, from the bill that they passed. But essentially, a lot of people, again, the first of the month has already passed. They've already had to um, pay rent, to push off bills, things like that. And so they're, even though that the, like, they, it was passed earlier, it still took time for these checks to actually go out um, to the respective recipients. Okay, so another thing we want to think about is the idea that um, increases in government purchases can cause an increased interest rate. So increases in government purchases may cause interest rates to increase which then can cause what's called crowding out so what crowding out is it's a decline in private expenditures as a result of increase an increase in government purchases. So if we think about it, if interest rates go up, um, firms, individual uh, individuals may be, may be less likely to, um, you know, invest in a new home or, um, you know, buy a durable good using credit. There's other things that could happen if the interest rates rise too much. So there can be an, what's called a crowding out effect if government purchases um, the increase in government purchases cause interest rates to also increase, which then results in a decline in private expenditures. Okay. So again, we're not going to be talking about, or we're not going to be going into a lot of depth about crowding out as far as graphically how to show that. So we're on our last two sections. Um, 16.6 covers deficits, surpluses, and uh, federal federal government debt. So really the main two things I want you to like pull out of that is just the idea of what a budget deficit and a budget surplus are. Pretty self-explanatory. Budget deficit is a situation in which um, government expenditures... are greater than tax revenue while a budget surplus is when government expenditures are less than tax revenue and i just included a link to a cool website that kind of graphically shows um the federal um budget deficit uh right now so obviously we are in a deficit right now i think um if i don't mess up the numbers as of march 2020 for this year um we already had a deficit of nine um, 119 billion dollars and then overall um for just public debt for the US, I think it was up to $17.66 trillion. So that's quite quite a bit of, um, of money when we think about it. So just kind of a quick note, as of March 2020, it was um, 119 billion, I think for the year. 
Um, you can look more at that website if you would like to explore that a little deeper. Okay, so the last section that we're going to be talking about is um, the effects of fiscal policy um, in the long run um, and also just kind of talking about economic growth. So um, really the fiscal policy we've talked about so far is concentrated on addressing short run goals of stabilizing the economy. Um, and so, but there are other fiscal policy actions that are kind of intended to have long run impacts on potential GDP. So essentially they're tr targeting aggregate supply rather than aggregate demand. And so since you are targeting aggregate supply using those fiscal policy actions, um, you're gonna refer to those at, um, actions as supply side economics and then kind of these policies they're kind of based on changing taxes in order to um, increase incentives to work um, incentives to save invest start businesses things like that um, remember, when we think about the long run growth rate of real GDP, it's depending mostly on, again, the number of hours um, worked, so kind of growth in that area, and then also the growth of labor productivity itself. Um, and so just keeping those in mind, um, it's kind of overall hasn't been super effective. And so um, just kind of, you know, long-run fiscal policy overall, um, it's kind of difficult to conduct that successfully. So I really think that's about it. We're not going to be going into the math on the multiplier too much, um, econometrics that talks a little bit about that in the appendix. So that's pretty much sums up uh, chapter 16. Hopefully this video is helpful. If you have questions, comments, concerns, please let me know.